Hi, I'm Brad Power, and I'm the co-founder of the Cancer Patient Lab with Brian, who's on here, and Rick Stanton. And this is our first uh, session. We typically have these weekly webinars. This is the first of 2024, and it's the first uh, really kicking off the Brain Cancer Lab, which is an expansion from us since we've mostly been involved in prostate cancer to date, and we're branching out into um, brain cancer and pancreatic cancer, thanks to collaboration with Cancer Commons. Uh, the standard uh, uh, disclaimer that we have at the front here is two things. First of all, this is not medical advice uh, that you should consult with your medical team. This is for information purposes only to give you ideas and thoughts and help you with your education so you can take things to your medical team. And the second is this is going to be public Everything you say can and will be made public, like your Miranda rights. And uh, so if you don't want uh, to be part of the transcript or part of the video recording, you can uh, you know, not put your image up on the Zoom. You can change your name and don't say anything. Uh, and then you can remain anonymous. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Al. Al is, uh, uh, the more I learn about Al, the more I am inspired by the fact that he's been doing what we're trying to do in the cancer patient lab for like decades. <laughs> and he's really been a leader in helping patients navigate brain cancer. Uh, I'm very excited to hear what he has to say today. <clears throat> and uh, You should know that we will also be making this, as I said, available to everyone through a video recording and notes and a transcript. So any of your friends who aren't able to be here today, uh, we uh, will will make it available through those other media. And this is meant to be interactive. Um, Al will start with some introductory comments to sort of set the stage, but then we hope that the majority of the hour will be spent in asking him questions. So thank you very much. Thanks, Al. Hi, I'm Al Musella, president of the Musella Foundation. I've been involved with the Musella Foundation for about 26 years now. Uh, I started because I had two family members who died of a glioblastoma. <laughs> I have a couple of disclosures right here, uh, but I would never let a sponsor change what I say. <laughs> okay, this is the vision of how to speed up the search for the QR. I say it's a vision because this is our plan. We've been working on it for years. And we're getting closer and closer, but it's just not there yet. We could need, use some help. Uh, I would say we're at least three quarters of the way to completing this this yeah, vision. I honestly, I... Sorry, was that a question? We should ask yeah, everyone to mute if they uh, if they're not speaking. Okay, so there's three parts to this: it's the data, the AI navigation program, and then access to treatments. <clears throat> First, the data. This is the important part. It starts with a regulatory grade registry that XCures is running. Um, all they need is your permission and a few details about you, and they could collect all of your medical records from every doctor, every, every medical facility, every MRI place. They collect thousands of pages of records on each patient, and the artificial intelligence percolates that data and structures it theoretically. It's not perfect yet. That's why I say it's a vision, but we're getting close. And it, picks out the important pieces so you could at a glance see the whole entire uh, history of the patient. You get all their biomarkers, all their treatments, the outcomes. Then we have virtual tour boards where we present cases to some of the world's experts, and then we record uh, the rationales for what they are suggesting for the patient, and we record what they're suggesting. Then we have some experts, some of them are here right now, um, I'll explain that role in a few seconds. And then we have all the medical literature to search. And then for each individual patient, we got all their data, all the advanced genomic testing, the imaging, all the treatments they did, what happened so far. So patient navigation program, uh, the way it's supposed to work, and we're getting close, but it's not there yet, as I say, the artificial intelligence suggests the best treatment plan options. And then the subject matter experts curate the options like they could take into consideration how uh, how the patient feels about treatments. Like, do they want to be cutting edge and try for a home run and risk, you know, losing out on 
current uh, standard treatments, or they want to be conservative, um, if they're willing to travel, if they could pay for options that might be expensive. So they, they curate that out and present the options to the patients and the doctor. <clears throat> the patient makes the final decision on what to try. And then the registry records a decision, the rationale for making the decision, and then the outcome to feed back into the AI loop. And then at the first line of recurrence, you repeat the process. This way we learn from every single patient. Um, we basically get inputs from doctors across the whole entire country, or actually the world, to see what combinations they're trying. And this system will be able to find the best combinations. Uh, previously, doctors were trying these combinations and nobody was tracking them. So we never learned from these patients. Somebody might have the cure and they keep doing it on their own, but if it doesn't get out to the general public, nobody else will benefit. So we're gonna keep track of all those options. Access, if the drug is available, there's cost issues and insurance issues, especially the off-label drugs. These drugs are expensive. They're like $20,000 a month for some of them, which is crazy. We have to work on different ways, but that's another topic. Then there's the regulatory hurdles. A lot of these drugs that we want to use are experimental, and you can only get them in clinical trials right now. The problems with the clinical trials, first, some of them, my favorite ones actually, have a placebo component, and I really hate placebos. I think we could get rid of those in the near future using the registry as a um, external control group. And that's one big thing that we should all be working on as a group. <clears throat> also, they're very rigid. You can't do the combinations that we want to do. And there's so many exciting things right now that could help like a third of the patients. But a third of the patients is not enough to gamble your whole entire life on. So like if you're doing a clinical trial, where a third of the patients are helped. In my mind, I would say, try three of these at the same time and maybe you'll have a chance. But under current conditions, you can't. So we wanna get easy access to these experimental treatments. And that's why I came up with the Promising Pathway Act. <clears throat> this was my idea, but I had a lot of people help me write it, the actual act. Promising Pathway Act is uh, in Congress right now it has no chance of getting passed right now, but we're working on a new version. Basically, it creates a conditional approval pathway for the FDA, where after you see that a drug is pretty safe and it has the effect you want it to have, um, it gets a conditional approval where any doctor could prescribe it. Insurance will handle it like any other approved drug. Um, but any patient who uses these drugs has to be followed as if they're in a clinical trial. So we learn from every patient. So you continue the research. The only difference from the standard pathway is it's more flexible where you could do combinations if you like. Um, and any patient could get access, whereas in clinical trials, it's only a very select, like 5% of the population who would get into clinical trial. We actually do more research with this because every patient uses it and all the combinations are being tracked. And then eventually we'll have enough data to say, yes, this should graduate to a fully approved drug or no, we shouldn't be using this anymore. So it increases the amount of research, it slashes the cost to get a drug approved, it slashes the time to get a drug approved, and it's more flexible. Um, this, this is another topic on itself. We'll do this at another meeting, the uh, Promising Pathway Act. Right now, I'm helping the Senator rewrite uh, the Promising Pathway Act to account for some of the criticism that we got about it. Mm -hmm. it was, it was too perfect and they want to water it down. And then there's a need for more and better treatments. With all these new genetic tests, we're finding good targets, but there's no drugs that could hit those targets yet. The, um, one of the problems is with a small disease like glioblastoma, it's hard to commit a billion dollars and 20 years of development time to hit a target that you're not sure of. And the Promising Pathway Act, instead of a billion dollars in 10 to 20 years, you could do it for maybe five million and three or four years, which is more doable. As a matter of fact, our organization and a few others could actually take researchers who have been funding grants for over the last few years that had good ideas and good products that have never gotten into people, and we could actually get those into people under the Promising Pathway Act. It's impossible under today's regulations. So the Promising Pathway Act, aside from getting us access to the current drugs. Uh, the current experimental drugs, it'll encourage the development of new experimental drugs. And we'll get to the cure much faster. So everybody asks me, if I had a glioblastoma, what would I do? 
Um, and I add that this is if access was not a problem. There's no way that anybody is going to get this treatment plan right now. Some of these are impossible to get, and you'll never find an oncologist willing to prescribe this for you. But this is how I think I would approach it if I happen to have the glioblastoma right now. I would really try to get these treatments. <clears throat> it starts out with a surgery, and I would pick the most experienced surgeon in our area. Well, I get really scared when I see people go to a local community hospital and have brain tumor surgery. This is one of the places where it really matters that you have the expert. But things like chemotherapy, it doesn't matter as much because it's all basically a standard plan. But for surgery, the more experienced surgeons could get more tumor out with less damage to you. So it's important to go to the experienced places. <clears throat> I would have them insert gamma tiles. I'll explain what those are in the next slide. Um, I take the tumor sample that's removed and have them make DC vax. I'll explain that again, and do advanced genomic testing. And this is the controversial one. I would defer external beam radiation. External beam radiation is like the standard, and it's like almost unheard of to not do the external beam radiation. I'm going to talk about that later with gamma tiles. But I have a, a lot of long-term survivors as friends. Some of them are doing OK, but most of them are having problems with the small blood vessels in their brain being messed up. So they're having little strokes. They're having other problems. Uh, even like Alzheimer's disease, strokes, all these bad problems. I'm talking 20 years down the line. And I'm going in with the, and in the past, they never cared about that because there was no long-term survivors, so it didn't matter. But now with a plan like this, I'm thinking we could get a majority of people into long-term survivorship. Now we have to start worrying about the future. I would start out too and try for over 90% compliance. The new high powder rays, I'll talk about that in a minute. I would start Keytruda and poly ICLC. We'll talk about that. Then uh, the temozolomide. Temozolomide, for those who don't know, is the standard chemotherapy used. But if you have an MGMT methylated status, it'll work a lot better than if your MGMT is unmethylated. Um, I'm not going to go into the reasons for that unless somebody asks the question, but uh, if it's MGMT methylated, I would use a temozolomide, but I would skip it with unmethylated MGMT. Then I'm going to sonodynamic therapy, which I'll talk about. And then if the genomic analysis finds a good targeted drug, of course I would use it. And then one of the keys is the advanced imaging. Uh, there's a few different imaging modalities now that are very advanced. One of my favorites is called fractional tumor burden mapping. And I'll talk about that. <clears throat> so gamma tiles first. These are biodegradable wafers implanted at the time of surgery, and they release radiation for about... Uh, Mostly for like two weeks and then a little up to eight weeks, I think it is. But for the first two weeks, it's a high dose of radiation. They're FDA approved and easily available. Uh, but using it instead of regular radiation is in a clinical trial now. So nobody's really doing that right now. You might have trouble finding somebody to do it, but I think it's worth a try. The publication for recurrent glioblastoma was amazing. They had 18-month uh, median survival for recurrent glioblastoma. That's a surgery at the time of recurrence with implanting of gamma tiles. Uh, there was no control group for this trial, but we only expect five to seven months of survival after uh, recurrent GBM. So it's way more than double survival. <clears throat> and of course, my hope is to combine all these things that each give a little benefit to hopefully make a cure available. Al, one question on the gamma tiles. Is <clears throat> limited to just recurrent GBM, or is it also inclusive of newly diagnosed GBM? It's approved for newly diagnosed and recurrent. Okay. So right now, they're doing the gamma tiles plus standard radiation. Gotcha. Only because they're afraid of not doing the radiation. It's scary to not do it. There was trials like 30 years ago where they skipped regular radiation, and the tumors grew so fast that it was overwhelming, and people died so quick that there's a tendency to avoid skipping radiation right now. And, and I'll add to, so Al's talking about this like ideal plan, you know, in an ideal world where you could combine all these things. But I know some people's hesitation right now, you know, they wouldn't necessarily want to get gametile at the newly diagnosed stage because it may um, preclude them from joining another clinical trial later on down the line. So like in an ideal world, I'd be like, yes, go for this. Um, but at this stage where things are right now, I would caution asking for these, you know, because it may rule out another option down the line. That's true. 
It's very true. You have to play it like a chess game and figure out a few moves ahead. <clears throat> DC Vax. This is a personalized therapeutic dendritic cell vaccine that's made from the tumor sample removed at the time of surgery. So it's personalized to your particular tumor. They applied for approval in the UK and should apply for FDA approval in the USA, but it's available now under a special access program in the UK. It's very expensive. It's like $200,000. You have to make like seven or eight trips to the UK. Um, I heard some people are smuggling it back, well, are bringing it back home somehow. <laughs> Were being recorded. Um, and as soon as it gets approved in the UK, in theory, you should be able to order it and import it from the UK. It'll still be expensive, but at least it'll be easy. It, and I'll, I'll put, put a comment on that too, because that's something we've looked in for too for my husband, Michael. Um, for the special access program, you know, the vaccine requires them to harvest your dendritic cells to make the vaccine. And because of the... Um, I guess the the freshness of the dendritic cells, they require the apheresis process to extract those cells to be done in the UK at this time under the compassionate use program in order to make the vaccine within the time frame they need to make it. Um, so I don't know what that'll look like once they get approval um, for that process. But uh, what right I'm thinking now is you'll have to go there at the beginning for that part and the first injection. But then after that, hopefully you could get it sent home. There's a yeah. FDA access program where you can import drugs that are not available in the United States. It's okay. a process, but I think it's going to be possible. Uh, but right now, you have to go there for each injection, and there's a lot of injections. Um, so by itself, it only provided a small increase in median survival. It didn't help the typical person, but it, it really helped. There's like a long tail to the survival curve, and more than double the percentage of long-term survivors. And none of these people had any side effects. So it's I think of it as just adding chances to you. And by itself, it's good enough to use because of the risk-benefit ratio, but we can improve it. So early results with combinations of immune enhancers look promising. Here's a survival graph of a small, it's a very small early trial. <clears throat> and what they did is they want to combine DC Vax, which they're calling ATLDC, with Keytruda. And these two lines are giving it, this one here is, they give it before the surgery and after the surgery. This is only after the surgery. And this, this is amazing because this is for your current your glioblastoma. Remember, the typical patient lives only five to seven months. So they would be down here someplace. This, this line is tremendous. Um, once you, so actually it's not good enough. Because only about half the people are long-term survivors. And I know some of these people in this group, and they're doing fantastically well. Um, but still, 50% is not good enough. But if you could get 50% from Optune and combine them, you might be up here someplace. And then you had the solid dynamic therapy. I think we're going to get really, really high on these groups. Uh, let me go back for a second. There's also a small study using a drug called poly-ICLC which also had similar, not as good as this, but similar increases. So if you could combine the DC Vax with the poly ICLC with the Keytruda, I think we're going to get a higher line than this. And things are starting to look promising. <clears throat> Optum, I see we have an Optum user right here. So you're going to love this part. <laughs> um, let me put this link. Oh, I can't put it in. I'll, I'll put this link in the chat room at the end. There's a lot of research going on on Optum, probably more than just about any other treatment for brain tumors. And somebody put it all together. Actually, it was Optum, uh, Novak, put it together into a cl clinical evidence flipbook where they gave the highlights of each of the trials. <clears throat> so going back to the beginning, in a large randomized phase three trial for newly diagnosed glioblastoma, the five-year survival was more than doubled. It was 13% versus 5% on the control arm. So that was a randomized trial, which is solid. So it at least doubles, almost triples survival. Then they had another uh, study come out that said if you use more than 90% of the time, uh, let me get back a second. Optune, uh, somebody has it here. Put your camera on for it so we can see it. It's basically rays that apply to the skull that are on all the time. You change them twice a week, or maybe three times a week. It's connected to a device that powers it. 
you don't have the device on all the time. You probably should have it as much as possible. You should have as much as possible um, because it only works while it's on. When you turn it off, it stops working. It's not like a drug that has a half-life. This is immediate. As soon as you turn it off, it stops. So you want it on as much as possible. If you use it more than 90% of the time, the five-year survival jumps up to 29%, which is amazing. Uh, there's new arrays that are not yet available that's going to increase the power. They're going to be more flexible, lighter, more comfortable, and should actually work better. So we should bump those numbers up a little bit higher. There was another study where you add Keytruda, which is an immune checkpoint inhibitor, and that added nine months to the median survival, which is also amazing. Putting all this together, where you have the Keytruda, the new arrays, using it frequently, I think you're going to get into the range of about the 50% five-year survival, which is the same as the PC Vax using a different mechanism. So by combining them, maybe we can get up to like 75% in five years, which would be a major, 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 major breakthrough. Then I get to solid dynamic therapy. This is my favorite new technology. It's experimental now. It's in clinical trials. It's very, very early clinical trials. I think they only did maybe 20 or 30 patients so far. Um, basically, they use a dye that's FDA approved. It's the same dye that they use at the time of surgery to tell the difference between tumor and non-tumor. So you put the dye in, you use special light, and you could see the tumor glows and normal tissue doesn't glow. So they took that concept, they give you the dye, <clears throat> instead of using light, they use ultrasound applied externally, just like when, you, when you're having a baby and they do the, the sonograms. And the so that the uh, oh, the focused ultrasound excites the dye molecules and kills the cells that took it up. So it basically kills the cells that are cancerous and leaves the normal cells behind. And the greatest thing about this is you could repeat it over and over and over again. Theoretically, it doesn't hurt. Uh, the minimal to no side effects, maybe a little swelling uh, that can be taken care of with other drugs. <clears throat> and by doing it over and over again, you stop it from getting gaining a foothold. Like, Right now, the plan, I think they do it once a month. Um, you could treat the whole entire brain. There's, there's two different ways of doing it now. One does small areas at high uh, intensity, and the other does a large area at lower intensity. We don't know which way works better, but the large area at low intensity treats half of the brain at a time. So you do half one week and half the next week, and you hit any of these cells wherever they are. And with the glioblastoma, we know you're going to have cells far away from the main tumor mass, and this should theoretically help mop those up. Um, like I said, it's very early, no results available yet, but it worked great in preclinical testing. So like, again, combining all these different things, I think we get a chance. Uh, then the advanced imaging. This is, this is like one of my favorite new technologies also. Uh, this is available. It's FDA cleared already. And it's available at some major centers, uh, and it'll be available everywhere soon. But if you look at the top and bottom images, you can see that there's something wrong. There's, it looks like tumors here. Uh, this could tell the difference. Like this area here, this whole area here is not tumor. It's just radiation effects and swelling. But if you look up here, it looks like tumor. And it looks the same as up here. But this is the only area of tumor. And the difference that this could make is, first of all, by serially doing this every month or every two months, you can tell if it's growing or shrinking much more reliably than just looking at the regular MRI image. So you'll be able to pick up uh, a recurrence fast and change course. Or you could see that it's actually working, even though the area that's non uh, tumor is growing. And that happens with pseudo progression. Pseudo progression means it looks like it's getting worse, but it's really not. The tumor is not growing, it's just dead materials collecting and uh, the swelling, and it makes it look like there's a tumor. Both DCVAX and Optune uh, triggered pseudoprogression in almost all of the long-term survivors. So what's happening is when we give treatments like this, and the doctor sees all of a sudden the tumor is growing, they stop. Or well, the patient sees like two months into the treatment with uh, Optune, it looks a little bit worse. So they say, oh, stop, forget it. it's not working. When in reality, it is working. And this could prove that it's actually working or not working. So this is very important. And also, you'll see progression on this one or two scans before you would on a normal MRI. And that saves plenty of time 
for you to try something else. It could also be used to plot out uh, stereotactic radio surgery. So you do stereotactic radio surgery to that area, and then hopefully on the next scan, it's all blue. Or you could also plot out some dynamic therapy with the high intensity one and just make sure those areas are treated. And that's about it. Any questions? So the way we like to do this is to use the chat feature and then I call on people that use the chat. We can also use the raise hand feature. Um, that's another way. So if you could raise your hand and use that as a way to ask questions. So you're now, you're going to ask me the questions, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll moderate. Yeah, I'll moderate to get them to you. Um, but let me just ask one. Uh, Brian's got his hand raised, but let me ask one, Al, just about your personal journey. You just shared a lot of wisdom. You said you've been at this for 26 years. Can you describe a little bit, and again, this is because we're we're like two or three years into this and you're 26 years into it, like you've got 10x more experience. Um, what, what's been your personal journey? You, you were uh, a doctor in Long Island. You had family members with GBM. Oh, yeah. And then so I was you... a foot doctor uh, for many, many years. And then my sister-in-law was diagnosed with glioblastoma. And this was back in uh, 1992. That was the year that the internet was actually invented. <laughs> so there was no internet resources. So I actually started most of the internet resources. I did the first online support group, the first website for brain tumors. Um, and then I snowballed from there. She happened to live like eight and a half years. We found a treatment that uh, her doctors didn't know about. It was a clinical trial at a different hospital. Back then there was no master list of clinical trials. So I helped set that up. Um, but she was at like Sloan Kettering in New York City and she didn't know that a hospital three miles away was doing something that might have helped. So we found that, she did it, and the rest is history. She lived eight and a half years. A few years later, like in 1999, my dad was diagnosed with glioblastoma. He didn't live that long. He, he couldn't even make it through radiation. He was much older and um, was a butterfly glioma on both sides. Um, he died quickly. Then I had a couple other relatives with other types of tumors, or brain tumors. One of them was fighting a uh, pituitary tumor right now. Another one died of a central nervous system lymphoma uh, last year. So it hit us pretty hard. I retired from the podiatry office back well, many years ago to uh, run the foundation full time. Great. And now Vanessa is helping me. Right. And sort of what, if, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Brian, but what, what have been your key learnings? Like what, what's been your evolution of what you've, like how would you describe your learning journey? What have you learned over time? What What's important? What what works? What doesn't? Those sorts of things. Well, this is going to sound controversial. <laughs> I probably shouldn't say it in public. But for the first 20 years, I was always of the thinking the best way forward is the clinical trial. And now I'm thinking that might not be correct because the way clinical trials are set up right now, you can't do these combinations, and I think we need the combinations. And the only way you can do that now is outside of trials. Uh, there's so many possibilities. You can't even design a clinical trial, a rigid clinical trial, to do that. We actually have a clinical trial that is worthwhile. Uh, I'll look it up while we talk. We're running on patient navigation program as a clinical study. And that type of treatment is perfect. Um, I see. No, I'll, I'll find it later. But okay. Can you find it? Um, yeah, you find it later. Um, and and I I I think that's very very important. It was in your slides, and and we 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 probably should schedule a separate session to talk about innovation in the I call it the what drug discovery process or the translational right. uh, translational medicine process. Like uh, my favorite example is somebody just called me yesterday. They have a diffuse midline glioma with the H3K27 mutation, and they want to know what to do. Right now, the best treatment for that is a drug called Onctol-1. And the only way to get it in the United States legally is in the clinical trial where they're testing it against an actual sugar pill placebo. Imagine having your child be told that there's a drug that's going to help. It helped about a third of patients like tremendously, and about half of patients it helped a little. It's an oral pill, non-toxic, 
but your kid has a chance of getting a sugar pill instead of a drug. To me, that's like devastating. I I just can't handle things like that. It's so sad. Um, there used to be a way to get it illegally in Germany, but uh, the drug company had them shut down. So right now you can't even get it from Germany anymore. So right now, the only way to get it is a clinical trial where you're going to have a chance of getting a sugar pill placebo. That's the right science from the point of view of the drug company. But from the point of view of the patient, that's just not right. That's one of the reasons we have the Promising Pathway Act. Under the Promising Pathway Act, that would have been approved about five years ago. Uh, it would have saved hundreds of kids. It's just, it's just a horrible situation. The FDA uh, doesn't want them to apply for approval yet. They need more data. They want a phase three randomized trial. Even though every brain tumor, uh, every pediatric brain tumor doctor wants this drug. Yeah, I think we I think that warrants a, a whole session and a follow-up just to understand that. Um and, and what we can do is as patients and patient advocates to uh, lobby for that legislation. Brian, uh, you had a question. Yeah, so um Al, just kind of a two-part question just in the um area of um uh, radiotherapy. So first is um, uh, surrounding proton therapy. So there's some discussion about proton therapy being better for, you know, tricky places to treat. Um, and I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. And then also, what about radio ligand? So in the prostate cancer space, um, we have some uh, treatment called Plovicto which is a radio ligand that targets the high expression of PSMA. Um, so I'm just curious if- Okay, let me start with the proton. Yep. Uh, the trouble with the glioblastoma is that it's diffuse. Mm -hmm. Like what you see on that target is only the main part of the tumor, but you're gonna have cells all over the place around it. So it's not one of those things where you want a very highly focused beam of radiation. Proton is very, very precise. Wherever you shoot it, it'll work. But just a few millimeters away, you're not going to have any effect, which is great when you have something vital, like you say, like if you're on the optic nerve, you don't want to hit the optic nerve, but you want a tumor, that's perfect. But in general, for glioblastoma, I don't think there's that much benefit over standard radiation. And then as for radio ligands, I like the concept um, but I think the safer ways, instead of using radio ligands, um, one of the projects that we've been trying to get into humans right now is uh, a combination of a targeted antibody against IL-13 receptor alpha-2, and it attaches a pseudomonas exotoxin. So it's like a smart missile, you inject it, and it only goes to, to cells that have the IL-13 receptor alpha-2, which in the human body is only the cancer cells, and testes and ovaries. So they inject it directly in the brain to avoid the testes and the ovaries. Um, so it brings the poison right to the cells that have it. They get ingested and they kill the cell. Um, the radio ligand is the same principle and it's good too. We just gotta see which ones work the best. Is that it, is that it Brian, or did you have another question? I could, I could keep going. I don't want to, um, you know, take the entire floor, but I'll just add, add a, a quick one. Um, so, Al, you know, it sounds like a glioblastoma uh, kind of runs in your family. Um, and this is a really naive question. Is glioblastoma um, a germline-based uh, cancer? Um, um, the reason I say that is that my aunt and her son both both had it as well. Um, yeah. So, yeah. There's a project going on to test that. Something like 5% are. It's not really the tumor, but it's a propensity to develop tumors. Um, and there's some syndromes like Lynch syndrome where you, you get uh, glioblastomas. But in my family's case, it was my sister-in-law and my father, so they're not related. Oh, okay. um, it's just it's just a get to be more common. I, I, well, I hear at least five new ones a day. <laughs> yeah. But uh, a small people, for a small group of people, it is hereditary. Um, there's a good Facebook group that's exploring this. They're doing an actual study. Uh, you might be interested in joining that group. I, I'll, 
Good master, can you look it up? You can drop drop it in a drop it in the chat. Um, yeah, and just so just to um, push on that a little bit further. So you talked a little bit about sequencing, right? So if they're going to go in and they're going to do surgery, you know, get get some sequencing done. Um, you know, one of the things that we've learned in the prostate cancer space is there's a whole lot of different flavors of sequencing. You know, it could just be, you know, a limited gene panel DNA. We could get into whole exome, uh, uh, whole genome, et cetera. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts in terms of like, what are the right diagnostics to apply to yeah. that incredible sure. yeah. pressure? We're, we're from precious. Yeah. We're actually trying to set up a meeting with a whole bunch of these companies to figure out the advantages and disadvantages of each. Right now, um, like my plan that I presented only requires the most basic of diagnostics of like MGMT status and IDH mutation status. Uh, for the vast majority of people who have these tests, it's not going to really show something that's actionable. I, think, I forget the numbers, but maybe 10 to 15% of people will have something that's actionable. And it could change the diagnosis, uh, change the treatment plan. Yeah. So it's still worth it to do it. And if you find something like the BRAF mutations, it's mm -hmm. really good because there's drugs against that. Yeah. As we get new, more drugs, it becomes more important. So we'll keep an eye on it. Um, uh, I'm going we'll gonna, gonna to push, push on that just maybe a little bit more. Um, in terms of the... Do, do you know the number of patients that actually do get se sequenced, the glioblastoma patients that do get sequenced? We had that, Vanessa. Do you remember? Uh, well, for so it's, uh, I, I hear two different numbers thrown around. So um, for those patients that, uh, you know, enroll with the X Cures through our patient navigation partnership program with X Cures, I think it's like 90 to 100% have their, um, you know, genomic testing for their tumor, but that, you know, that's part and parcel of just being part of our program and getting that recommendation and advocating for it. Um, outside of, of um, you know, our <laughs> virtual trial, I think it's a lot less. And I think the percentage would really depend at the major academic centers. I think it is fairly standard if you're in the community based practices. Uh, it is far, far less common. I want to say I've heard like 10 percent. And then could that include liquid biopsy as well? Is that relevant in the space or is it all tissue based? Tissue based. Tissue based yeah. It does. Okay. 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 Great. Liquid biopsy is experimental right now. Yeah. New York, uh, New York State just passed a law that goes in effect next January that says all insurances in New York have to pay for these uh, genomic testings, which is a good step forward. Yeah. And just to add on to something what Vanessa said, uh, the people who go into our project, are much more highly motivated like this group here. So they're more likely to have the test. And if they don't have it, we recommend that they do it. And a lot of times they'll go back and do it. It seems to me like there's an opportunity for like a Count Me In project um, to be um, dedicated to glioblastoma like there is in, in prostate cancer. The, you know, there's the metastatic prostate cancer project, which is part of Count Me In. Right. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's very much for research focus. It's a very a different application than what we're doing. But they are acquiring um, this knowledge to hopefully uh, identify well, targets. We're basically doing that with glioblastomas right now. With okay. Us. Okay, that's true. Yeah, you mentioned that. Okay. And uh, we're working with a couple of pediatric groups. But aside from doing all this, we're also collecting tissue samples that could be used for research. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, and Alan, Vanessa, just for the record books, how many patients do you have in your database, more or less? Um. Uh, X cures like all cancers. I know they're. I hope I'm not quoting a wrong uh, number, but I think 140,000 total patients in the registry. And then for GBM patients, uh, I believe there's over a thousand, but I could be wrong. Al, do you know? Adrian, do you know the number, Adrian? I want to say also around a thousand sounds about right. Yeah. Great. That's funny. Okay. I used to get weekly reports, but I don't get them anymore. <laughs> I got to look into that. The next question is from uh, Jeff Krolik, um, asking about the mechanism of, of action for Optune. Uh, there's a whole bunch of mechanisms. That paper that's linked. There's a fantastic paper that came out, uh, I believe, in 2022 that explored the mechanism of action. There's multiple, and there's still a lot we don't know. I'm going to try and find the link to that paper, and I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, the basic 
the reason it got started was um, it's alternating magnetic fields, electrical fields, but it, it, there's a magnetic component to it. So any cell that's dividing, as the spindles form and I try to separate, it's uh, very sensitive to these magnetic fields changing. And these fields change like 60 times, I, I forget the uh, frequency, but they keep changing and they actually stop these spindles from uh, separating the right way. And this a very nice video floating around where they show the cells when they're at that stage and they're trying to separate, they just blow up because they can't take it. Then there's also, so once the cells blow up, it releases these new an neoantigens into the environment and they trigger an immune response. So it has the two mechanisms. It's first, it actually stops the magnetic dipole moments from working the way they're supposed to. And then once they kill the cells, it exposes the antigens that were inside the cell to the body and the body could then attack it. That's one of the reasons why we say use uh, Keytruda, which is an immune checkpoint inhibitor. The immune checkpoint inhibitors by themselves did nothing with glioblastomas. You have to trigger the immune response before you could enhance it. So the immune checkpoint inhibitors only increase the response, but they don't start it. So if you start it with like DCVAX or Endor Optune, they could make it much more powerful. And then your question. There's a whole bunch of other little mechanisms, and it's outlined in that paper. Jeff, that answered your question, I presume? Okay. And I guess the other question, and it's a general question, and I'll, and David Plunkett is up next, but uh, looking across a number of the therapies you're talking about, whether it's Optune, or sonodynamic therapy, David, you can ask the question, but to what extent are they uh, GBM specific and to what extent might those same technologies be applied to other cancers? Okay, Optune is being applied to many other cancers, um, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer. Um, it's actually easier to use on the body than on the head. Hmm. But the, the problem that it has is it's, uh, it's like localized to where you could aim the arrays. So like if you have pancreatic cancer that hasn't spread yet, it could do it pretty good. But once it's spread, if it's, you know, the whole body, you can't treat a whole body with Optum. Um, as far as sonodynamic therapy, they're starting on the brain because it's such, it's so elegant, but it should theoretically apply anywhere because it doesn't have to be this one specific dye. There's a lot of different dyes that can be used that have an affinity for different types of cancers. You just have to find the right dye, and then it should be easy. And really, the limiting but, factor is causing swelling within the brain. Like if you kill too many cells at one time, uh, which is why they don't do the whole brain at one time, um, if, if you get swelling in the brain, it causes problems because there's no space for it to expand. So you have to give steroids or have to decrease the swelling. If you're doing like a prostate case, for example, swelling there, yeah, you know, it might hurt, but it's not going to cause any problems. Well, my initial impression is that that's a, a good opportunity for a, a PSMA ligand. Instead of a radioactive payload, a uh, a, uh, a dye payload that's sensitive to uh, sonodynamic therapy. Yeah. It's very similar to the photodynamic therapy that they do on the skin lesions. But the trouble with photodynamic is it's hard to get the light deep inside. So with ultrasound, they can hit any place in the body. Uh, next up, we have Lisa, uh, Lisa Coleman. Uh, Lisa, do you want to uh, uh, say your question, which is in the chat? Sure. I've seen um, a new tumor, tumor treating fields uh, device where they refer to it, I think, as Voyager. And yeah. you wear a band instead of the arrays. I believe it's in clinical trials, but I'm wondering, do you know anything about it? Do you think we'll see it in the next couple of years? It's funny. My first reaction to it was that it, it can't possibly work. Yeah. But some of my favorite doctors are on the board doing it. And I asked them, and they say they're not sure yet. But they don't discount it yet. Um, it's a much easier device to use, but they don't have the research behind it that Optune has. Um, I don't think you could get fields as high strength as Optune without having the arrays on. I talked to the people who created Optune about 
the exact thing. I said, look at this device. I showed them the device and I said, can't you make something that you don't have to shave your head for or attach to the skin and irritate the skin? They said they tried it and they just can't get the field strength high enough. So it's something to look at. There's also a magnetic device uh, being done down in Texas. That's even more promising, I think, but it's still way too early. Uh, it's another thing where you don't have to shave your head. You don't have to wear it all the time. It's only a few hours a day. Um, and it's a direct magnetic thing instead of uh, electric. There's a lot of exciting stuff coming out. But Optune has way more research behind it. And I like the fact that it has that research behind it. The next step is Ibrahim Nana. Ibrahim, what are your what's your question there? It's in the chat. Uh, so basically, my son, my son is in the Cervax trial, but uh, with the placebo, he only has a sixty percent chance of getting the real vaccine. So I want to cover all bases, and uh, out of your suggestions that you you uh, your suggestions are any that can be done concurrently, openly, or can some be done um, secretly? I guess. <laughs> Well, that's a good question. The Cervaxim trial is one of my favorite trials. I, I love Cervaxim. As a matter of fact, we're trying to raise money right now to create an expanded access program for it so people don't have that problem. Um, the trouble with the Cervaxim trial, and I could be wrong, but right now they're not combining it with Keytruda, are they? They are not. Yeah, not, they, not that I've seen. They did a small trial of combining it with Keytruda that seemed to work a lot better than using Cervaxim alone. But then for some reason, they went back to Cervaxim alone for this trial. And I have no idea why. Um, and it's the only reason, well, if I couldn't get DC Vax, I would try to get Cervaxim or one of the other vaccines. Um, another problem with Cervaxim is it's only against one target, although that target is theoretically like ubiquitous in glioblastomas. Um, I really can't say to add something to it because they're not the, really going to let you. Yeah. Things are going to be obvious. Like if you get on an immune checkpoint inhibitor, sometimes they have bad side effects. And they'll be questioning, you know, why are you like this? <laughs> that's, okay. that's one of my problems with the current clinical trial system, but that's for another day. So is yeah. there a chance that this, this may, that pathway that may happen earlier so that he can make, make sure he does get, in fact, the vaccines? But so again, I'm sorry. What's the timeline for not having to be, be, be on a placebo? That, that... Um, there's a lot of money to be raised. It's probably not going to happen this year. Um, just have to hope he, has, he got the vaccine. Then. You have to hope that he got the vaccine. Yeah. Okay. At, the first, at the first sign that it's not working, like I would say, use those um, the advanced imagery to make sure that it's working. But at the first sign that it's not working, you drop that that trial and go into something else. Like the, the best thing, the easiest thing to use at the same time is Optune. But they'll know about that. You have to try to convince them. Um, but if you can't do it now, do it at the first sign that there's uh, any kind of progression. Yeah, thank you. But that is one of my favorite trials. Not one of my favorite drugs. Okay. Um, Adrian, you put a couple of things in the in the chat. Would you uh, have comments on those or anything else? Sure. I was just, um, just Brian wisely brought up the Count Me In project. I just wanted to show. I've seen that they're starting a brain tumor component. And I think we'll all learn about that next week. Well, we'll learn more about the Count Me In project next week. Um, from Ellie Van Allen. So definitely something to keep tabs on. And then the other link was the Stanford study that Al was referring to about familial GBM and the genomic underpinnings or genetic underpinnings there. Great. And I see Vanessa also posted the Optune Mechanism of Action paper. Yeah, so and I'll just chime in to follow up on Ibrahim's question. You know, Al, Al went over all these great new promising, you know, 
treatment strategies, but he said in the beginning, and I'll say it again, right now for us as patients and caregivers, it's a very frustrating chess game. And, you know, right now we don't have access to a lot of these things concurrently. And so you sort of have to pick and choose which ones you're going to pursue. And if you do pursue one and it doesn't work, you got to pivot really quickly to the next one. Um, and that's where I think our patient navigation program is very helpful because on a patient by patient basis, they'll help talk to you about, you know, which one you want to pursue first, which one do you want to go after second? Um, and, and if there are adjuvant therapies, whether that's repurposed meds or supplements, you know, the other things you can look at. Just for the, again, for the record books, that patient navigation program you're referring to, can you say a bit more about that? Uh, Adrian, do you want to take that question? Sure. I think a lot of people on this call have worked with us at Cancer Commons, and we work very closely with Vanessa and Al at the Macella Foundation to just stay on top of the latest research resources um, and talk with patients about what they're hearing. Um, actually, just Lisa Coleman on this call today brought up um, some really wonderful insight she'd gathered about um, hypermutated TMZ and glioblastoma. So honestly, we feel very privileged um, to hear such wonderful information and, and kind of continue the discussion so we can all learn from each other. Great, thank you. And that's partly what our online discussion forum that we're we're you know starting to launch and build up is is also there for for a continuing conversation when people come up with ideas they can share or questions they have. Uh, we've just got a few more minutes before the hour. Any other thoughts, Al? Any kind of takeaways, uh, Vanessa, Adrian? Any any other things you want to say to wrap things up? Um. Just that as a group, we should really try to get that promising pathway act passed. Right now, we don't have to do anything because we're in the process of uh, rewriting it and it's going to get reintroduced in a couple months. But once it gets reintroduced, we should really be fighting as hard as possible to get that. It will get rid of all these problems that we're having. You'll be able to do whatever treatment you want. You'll have access to everything. We'll get a whole bunch of new treatments coming in. Um, it'll make our lives a lot easier. Yeah, let's, let's definitely plan on a follow-up session just on that. Um, we'll do that right at the time that it's reintroduced. Great. When, well, when would that, if when anybody would that has ideas out? on how to improve it, I'm, I'm open to suggestions right now. <laughs> do you think that's in like six months or wh how long do you think uh, it'll be? I think it's, uh, when do the new Congress people get signed in? I don't remember. Like there, there's a change in the guard right now. The person I was working with is actually stepping away from Congress. Uh, so we have another person who's taking over, which is good. Um, but a whole new group of people come in, I think mid-January. So I figure about two months after that. So February, March, March, April, maybe. Okay. Great. We'll, we'll, we'll calendar that. Any thoughts, Vanessa, Adrian? Okay, great. Well, um, I won't do the car talk line. I bet you've wasted a perfectly good hour, <laughs> but uh, it's been it's been great to uh, launch the uh, Brain Cancer Lab. Thank you, Al, for all of your wonderful insights. It's uh, quite a menu there. A lot to learn. There's a lot to. I'm sure every one of those items on there is a deep dive in its own right, and uh, we'll have to come back to this and discuss it further. Thanks. Thanks.